If you guys haven't seen Down Down Episode 7, y'all are missing out. We got Down Down Episode 7 blew everyone's expectation for Mr. Sinchi. Let's get it. Man, I wish someone would caress my balls like that. Dun Dun Episode 7 really was something else. The show has never failed to present themselves how creative they can be. Okay. With the color palettes, visual style, wanting to chew some dick, but I'm gonna keep my own. That's the thing, right? The ball jokes in the beginning, the weenies, give me your bananas. We were set up expecting this show to be just chaotic, fun bullshit. I didn't realize the level of depth in, in an emotional way that could compel me from Dan to Dan. That's why when everyone was hyping episode 7, like, I think by the end of the Turbo Baba arc, for sure, there was like a sentimental theme with Turbo Baba's lore, which is also not fully described, right? It's kind of like loose of like, oh, there was a bunch of SA victims, Turbo Baba wanted to protect them, and that's kind of why she's always saying, give me your weenies and stuff. Yes, it's funny, and, but in hindsight, when you know the lore, it's just like, oh, shit. And then episode 7, it's, oh, it was a, it was a truck that hit me. I felt like I should have gotten isekai Overall thoughts for Donadon on my other video, since you guys want this episode breakdown more. I thought I was yes, going to chill for a bit on vids, since I've been on a streak. An edging streak? But this episode came out of nowhere. Not really. I know from the preview and stuff list that it's gonna be a standout, but- I have no understanding of anyone here, these names. The only names that I really remember- I don't even remember like voice actors' names. It's mostly just like, uh, anime soundtrack composers, but... I guess this is an elite lineup. Stuff list that it's gonna be a standout, but to this degree... It was unexpected. Shuto yep. Inamoto did the storyboards. Animation directed in this episode. What a and god. it was directed by Kotaro Matsunaga. Inamoto was the backbone of the episode. He did a lot. Not only he did the storyboards. Bro, that kid dancing there is gonna have more frames than Blue Lock entirety of season 2 U20 arc. Bro, what the fuck? He animation directed slash supervised the drawings this episode. And of course, animating some parts. It's not far-fetched to say he supervised the entire episode since he was was the only person credited as animation director Giga -chan. and Hana Okutani as assistant animation Damn bro, Moko-chan, Shuto Enomoto, Hana Okutani, Hiroshi Seko, Shuto Enomoto, they, these dudes are just, these people, they are the reason why we have art. Director, with no chief animation director credits anywhere to be seen, which is surprising since Dandadan's credits can look a bit worrying with the amount of ADs and chief ADs it can have. Another aspect that's very impressive is Enomoto was credited as sub character designer and clothing design. Okay. I'll be honest, I don't know what clothing design means. The person designing the clothes, but it's from the manga. The manga already shows you the clothes anyways. But he seemingly did the original design for this episode. That's why the design slash style is different compared to the other episodes. I the see. line art is thicker. It also helps the fact that Donadon's style, at least for the colors of the characters, it feels less process in a way. So the line art definitely stand out more than the colors that don't feel overpowering. Like example is Sakamoto Days. I don't know what the fuck they did. Either it's compositing filters or or what but the colors look a bit too vibrant in a way huh there's so much like levels of knowledge in animation quality like i'm just a monkey that just watches anime and says haha bald so i can't even realize like the actual difference in the mechanics regarding the animation directing for sakamoto days and dan dan, dan. this is like so much depth that i'm just so ignorant on this is Shuto Inamoto's first time storyboarding. It's clear he was an incredible animator and artist, but putting him as the storyboarder for episode 7 of Don to Don, you promote this guy. A work of art. The story. The, the Shuto Inamoto guy, the dude, just let, let that person do everything. Storyboards, shot composition, transition, visual storytelling. It feels very heavenly delusion since Inamoto was very involved with that project. You can feel some similarities in this episode. This anime, I felt, was a hidden gem that was not well received by the public. At least for me and my audience. First episode we watched, I think we watched one or two episodes, and it was very interesting. Like, very, very different from the types of anime we've been seeing, but not a lot of people kind of, you know, they just, they just want the stupid isekais. Episode with, like, this scene kind of feels like a 
Maru touch. Or another way I can put it, it feels like a Kai Ikarashi episode, but it still feels like a Donadon episode with the style or strong heavy color palettes it uses because Moko-chan is still assistant directing for the episode. I gave enough praises for Enomoto. Now to the episode. Well, I'll still glaze Enomoto. Okay, of this here video. we go. We start off with this incredible POV shot. I still don't know if this is a 3D space or real. We saw the same thing in episode 4, but that was apparent that it was a 3D background. Mm. Or if you want an example of a live action one, it's with the recent Monogatari season. Here, I don't know. It is like stop motion-y and the ground doesn't look real with how it's textured. I'm a- This is crazy. I- Bro, there's so many things I just don't know. I'm not looking at the ground. Stop motion through. What the fuck is that? I'm just looking at this being, oh shit, POV. Someone's running. Panting noises. Who could this be? And then we have the whole recall at the end when we have, you know, Akrosokia running. Guess it's a 3D space. Still incredible. The whole chase scene is amazing. Really utilize the background and makes you immersed with the environment. With the camera tracking Okarun or just showing the background more with the camera movement. And most of it is an illustrated background, meaning it stays the same drawing for the scenes beside the stuff that comes the in hair. contact or gets destroyed with acrobatic silky. With this railing, this box, this other box, this wall and some more. Also, everything is flat, the background, characters, so you have to give that illusion of death more so with the character moving closer to the camera or farther to the camera. Man, I had no idea what this video was gonna be. And this is just, this is just a master course on like production value deconstruction. I thought that this was gonna be like a video essay talking about the whole backstory and how like emotional it was. No, we're just being taught just this is how animation is done. Camera, the animation itself, how bouncy or nimble Okarun moves compared to like... Yeah, it's very educational. Moves. And guys, the monster is hand-drawn? What? Usually most of the monsters or yokais are CG besides Turbo Baba or the alien's fake appearances. I think the CG is okay, but the it's way okay, they composited yeah. it and using bold color palettes signifying the individual monsters definitely help to mix it with everything. Yeah, I think that like that part, making it bold, compositing it, I guess it's like how CGI is like overlay with everything else. The 3D and the 2D, right? It felt fluid. There was nothing that made me feel like, oh, this is like a whiplash as you transition from 2D scenes into boom, 3D CGI, just like failure frame over and over. Acrobatic silky. Yeah, the colors, right? The colors being like very saturated and bold like that, I think it, it kind of like um, hides the more CGI-esque elements. It's a very detailed monster to draw, but Enomoto, who supervised this episode, make the design more detailed with the line count folds, the bumps, or just the understanding of the anatomy is crazy. And the hair animation is great too. Yep. I already said the drawing quality of this episode has its own style, how volumetric it is, and it's consistent through the episode. The storyboards are great. Again, really use the environment in the chase, and this change of speed, like showing close-up shots, then boom, explosion or something. This occurred morphine sequence is one of my favorite cuts this episode. Just how I love his collar. His collar like popping out here is so cool. Smooth, it transitions to his other form with yep. his hair slowly changing with Look at that. colors or his clothing moves like water. And I love this monotone coloring style when Momo was reaching for their hearts. I want to put most of my talking points or praises to the flashback. This yep. is when Enomoto really showed his talent as his story. Like everything before this was great. It was fun, exciting upbeat but then this part i felt even a monkey like me was like huh now this is what you would unironically called cinema storyboarder artist or just an understanding of using this medium to its fullest the theme that's mostly present in this flashback or even in the beginning of the episode is visual storytelling. I don't read the manga, but Enomoto is trying to give more immersion to the scenes, give you more intact to the characters, or just more meaning to others. That's right. Could you imagine that? People actually taking the manga and then making the anime, make that manga panels come to life even more. Rather than having fucking panels just shown with lines happening to make it look like things are moving, like blue lock, 
this is how anime should be done. You're not supposed to just fucking draw the manga art and plaster it and just drag shit around. There's scenes, there's barely any dialogue speaking this whole flashback. That's right. This is the pinnacle of show don't tell. I love that. I think that the term show don't tell is just a very good litmus test of does the show respect the audience and how deep a show could be. Because if the show just constantly kept spoon feeding you, this is this, this is that, here, in summary, in other words, blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, whatever. But like seeing everything happen in the flashback, limited dialogue, just scenes, symbolism, right? Imagery. It, it just tells you the story more than you could ever read and understand that story. Besides some scenes, it's through audio, music, character movements, yep. color palettes, signifying different emotions. It's not just giving movements to certain panels, it's elevating it with the stuff available in anime. Yep. It's what makes these two mediums different. You have Kensuke Ushio's soundtrack playing in the background. That Bro, that piano soundtrack. I, I do believe that the piano, for sure, right? The uh, animators, they went crazy for this. But I think the piano soundtrack was like the final touch that just like enhanced it to a next level. Maybe this wouldn't have hit as hard if it was some other soundtrack that wouldn't have delivered these emotional tones. As soon as I heard the piano, even though nothing was happening, right? I started to break down before anything actually started to happen because the piano started to play, which made me think, oh, oh fuck, 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 fuck. This is going to be so tragic. That makes so well with everything happening. How the OST slowly sounds distorted because she's doubting or blaming herself. Yeah, you have like the distorted, like I, I felt like it was almost like a toy box soundtrack, you know, from like ReZero, yeah, the kiss of death. But yeah, this distorted wonky soundtrack was great. Everything happening. How the OST slowly sounds distorted because she's doubting or blaming herself to everything that happened with her daughter. It's not just because Kensuke Ushio's soundtrack is amazing, but also the work of the episode director. Yes. Kotaro Matsunaga really plays these soundtracks at the perfect time. Yeah, that's right. It's not a matter of having a good soundtrack. It's also knowing when do I play these soundtracks and how can I sync the soundtracks, you know, moments? There's going to be really uh, emotional moments, different parts of this whole soundtrack that needs to match what happened in the source material. Although Enomoto was the one that built the aesthetic for this episode, it's not denying Matsunaga played his part perfectly translating Enomoto's vision in this episode. Also, he did some work in Love Life. <laughs> Based. <laughs> Based the go again, most of the episode communicates through the visuals and sound, especially in the flashbacks. How this subtle shot of acrobatic silky standing on her yep. tippy toes has a more deeper meaning in the end. How the sound of the shower, a glimpse of her being exactly like the sound of the shower. First thing you see is a woman in bed with a bunch of bills on the table, and you see sh and you hear a shower in the background. You didn't have to tell me anything. I already know what the fuck is happening, and that's how amazing this is. Being naked in bed, and the money clarifies to the viewer that she's a yep. prostitute, or how Acrobatic Silky was high up with the light. That's right, the last dance. This is crazy, bro. The high up sky, you see the sky, but you also see the sky rises, right? She's clearly in the rooftop. Her daughter's been taken away. Her eyes are gouged out. She's pretty much almost dead. And then she starts dancing. And it's just like, oh my god. She's about to jump while doing the last dance. Circles, things, or the city being lower leveled than her. It's the same thing what Kinuyasu Nishina did with his or her episode. <laughs> this fucking piano. This goddamn piano. Bro. It's that the piano is so good. So it's in Oshinoko. You don't have to tell us with every scene like, oh my god. I want to buy that dress for my daughter. Exactly. The show don't tell. You have a woman that's working, you know, as an escort that got the bills. And as she's on the way home, she sees a dress in the window and she looks at it. And I'm like, what? What could this be? And then you see the daughter later on and you're like, oh, shit, she loves dancing. Mom used to dance. Mom wants to save money to get her this dress. You don't have to say anything. You don't need monologues. Just show it. You don't need to tell us. 
The boards with the seamless transitions and great framing work. The compositing too, how warm the scene looks when everything goes great. Even in a darker setting, how the light shines with these two. And the other side with a sense of guilt or desperation to provide the pink, for your child. Yeah. The scene where the mom got beat up by the debt collectors. I don't know if debt collectors also steals people's children. I don't know. Was amazing, but... I just assumed they were like Yakuza or something. Tragic at the same time. The screeching scream from the kid really grips you on how disturbing this scene is. Yep. With even the rain slowly... Like, even like the glass being embedded in her arms. Quite often, it, it, it's like... When you shatter through a glass, I'm like, how could you have all these different lacerations? Obviously, if you've never done it, you don't fucking know. You just kind of clash through the grass. But if you land on it and the glass, you know, gets lodged into your skin, the, the way that it cut her arm was like, oh. I don't know. Was amazing, but tragic at the same time. The screeching scream from the kid really grips you on how disturbing this scene is. Yeah, the even blood the splattering. the slowly starts to sound louder. Then we get the full context of this POV. That's right. At this point, it's just like, holy shit, it's the intro scene. We saw, we saw in the beginning, this whole sequence of her on top of the building is beautiful. The staff, especially the compositing team, never disappoint us in the show in terms of photography. But this scene takes the cake. How the starry blue night sky yep. reflects to the floor, making this whole sequence just feels beautiful, yet unnerving with the soundtrack playing. I haven't even said anything about the animation for the flashback. Again, Enomoto corrected most of the movement and drawings from what it seems how three dimensions oh, i love this part of the soundtrack when it went from beyond just piano had other instruments coming in i think it's supposed to be like a a cello maybe some sort of string that they're plucking in for the flashback again enomoto corrected most of the movement this part. and drawings from what it seems how three dimensional everything is like this shot of the daughter with her mouth and the teeth animated by kana ito the movement slash character acting signifies so much how happy it can be a good example is silky's daughter dancing immaturely that she's a kid and doesn't know how to ballet dance yet just the subtle stumbling is great how unsettling it can be or how beautiful in a lot of ways a great adaptation is not that's right it's like it's it's so tragic but it's so beautiful you see the absurdity the horrific you know acts happening but there is like a tragic beauty in it that the animators are trying to tell us not just giving movement to make sense from panel to panel it's what you utilize in this space how you can exceed from already a great manga slash story to translate that to a medium that provides you with more tools than manga it's how you tell a story from animation and audio visuals you think yeah. because they didn't like this is a master class on what an anime should be like the manga panels you're not just copying it you're telling a story and enhancing the experience of the source materials beyond what the manga readers could have possibly comprehended. Maybe I'm wrong here because I haven't read the manga, but I felt like it's my assumption that something like this probably just enhanced the experience for a lot of source material readers where they didn't even think that this flashback could have been this impactful adapt silky jumping off of a building one to one is bad no it's giving more context of what is precious or important to her ballet dancing was her image even as a spirit because yep. it was and that, that dress was too to her with the daughter learning ballet through silky the most 8-bit studios could never they actually can't because like what i witnessed through Dan, Dan, Dan this is like love this is like a passion so much talent just all uniting to just giving the manga just to life. And then the exact opposite is greedy motherfuckers that just wants to min-max, put in the least amount of effort to provide the most, just like the least viable product, right? It's called a minimum viable product, an MVP, a prototype. It's supposed to be a draft, right? It's just a working prototype that you show. And it's like, see, it, it works, right? It's passable, right? It's like, nah, get that shit out of there. Moments that made her happy, putting everything just for a dress or shoes, although things just didn't end what she... And the studio for this is called Science Saru, right? And for sure, I think that it's not just a studio, it's the elite roster of, you know, these directors and animators all coming together. Like, I don't think Science Saru is gonna have Shuto Enomoto, you know, handling everything, right? I'm sure this is, this is like one of those moments, like in One Piece too, where One Piece has these key priority episodes and they bring all the best people, you know, to gather. So are, are these contractors? Are, are these like, you know, 
mercenaries for hire when you know an episode needs to be priority it's like all right come take over I i'm not sure how this works wanted it to be and the last act that she did was the thing that can make her remember the moments that she can cherish but in the end it seemingly didn't matter it's that neck crack too. When she landed and you hear the crack of the neck, oh, haunting. How you present those aspects in a story, and it's how the climax hits you so hard, even though it's something so insignificant, but it means so much, and giving her more closure that everything was not her fault. We get more context of the Arya and the spirit flashback on why everything is white and so mm. transparent. It's because she died, and That's Ida right. can see her. The last Children can see the supernatural. At that point, Akrosoki has passed and is, you know, just here as like, I guess, some sort of like wraith or ghost, right? And she mistakenly sees Ida as her daughter and she deludes herself into thinking, yes, that is my daughter. And the whole obsession of trying to call, you know, me mommy, mommy. And then because Ida also witnessed all of that flashback, right? She then gives him like comfort. And like, I wonder if she will significantly change. I have no doubt that Momo and Ida are going to continue beefing like we've seen before. But on like a deeper level, will she continue to be like, yep, I'm special. I'm so pretty. That's all that matters. Or after learning from this, because there seems to be something missing in her head. Because when her mom passed away, the dad was acting tough in order to obviously not make the child, you know, emotionally disturbed. But that aspect of we got to move on. It is what it is. I wonder if that kind of twists a child into growing up to a person that Ida is. Who knows? But after this, I feel like this is going to definitely like... <laughs> it, it felt like a closure for her. I think I mentioned in a reaction where... Akrosilki is getting closure, but also Ida is also getting closure for the mom that she never really had by saying this. Last scene animated by Kana Ito was again beautiful and the boards provided by Enomoto was fantastic. The seamless transitions, music, lighting, drawing quality, and this cut of acrobatic Silky's hand, the volume control, and how it slightly hesitated for a second. It <laughs> That's crazy bro. The, the arm animation here, the level of nuance and meaning in simply this one arm animation is more than anything 8-Bit Studios could possibly give me. Why are you doing this shit to Blue Lock and the Tower of God? Actually, Ape is is not Tower of God. That's Bandai Namco, the uh, production committee responsible for those two projects. Static Silky's hand, the volume control, and how it slightly hesitated for a second is amazing in a lot of ways. I can't thank Enomoto, Matsunaga, mm -hmm. and the stuff behind this the episode. Goat. I can't put all my thoughts in this video because I don't want to make... It's too hard. You know, it, it's, it's just... <sighs> It's so hard to put into words what happened in episode 7 because of how just cathartic it was. Get long because again, I have been on a streak. An edging streak. I don't know when the Dun Dun video will come out. Yeah. Maybe in a few weeks. But if you guys like this video, leave a like. Yes, sir. I had no clue what kind of video this was going to be. I thought it was going to be, you know, your run of the mill uh, video essay where they're going to say Dun 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 episode 7 changed my life. And then some simple shallow talking points about, you know, what happened in the show. Here's the link to, you know, Mr. Senshi's video, by the way. Please go give him a like, share his channel if you want. But, like, this was a master course on just animation, production value, direction, soundtrack, everything that happens beyond the scenes, right? How it was adapted, a team that was brought in to do such a thing. And then just highlighting some of the most important things regarding show, don't tell, right? Directing. Fantastic video. I'll see you next time.